Welcome everybody to the Knowledge Network on Climate Assembly learning call on the German Citizens Assembly on Climate. It's a real pleasure to have you all here. Um, this is another opportunity for us as a community to learn from the practice of a recent climate assembly and it's part of Kanoka's mission to improve the practice of climate assemblies at all levels. Why have we chosen to focus on the German assembly? In many ways, the assembly looks like or has similar characteristics to other assemblies that have taken place. It had 160 members recruited through Civic Lottery. It was given the task of working out how Germany could stay within its legal obligations of the Paris Agreement. It met over a number of evenings and Saturdays between April and June uh, 20, this year. It broke into working groups on mobility, buildings and heating, energy and, and food production. And it voted on a series of recommendations producing a final report all very similar to the sorts of things we've seen before. But I think there are at least two things, and maybe we're gonna learn more today about other aspects of the process that make the German assembly particularly interesting. First of all, it was a civil society initiative. It was not set up by government. It was set up by a coalition of civil society organizations. Secondly, it, it appears at least from, from my perspective, but the role played by the scientific community was much more extensive, both in terms of establishing the assembly and ensuring the robustness of the recommendations that emerged. So during this call, I'm going to be talking to um, four people who are involved in different ways in the German assembly, in the German assembly process, and I'll introduce them as they as, as they emerge. Uh, we're also going to hear from uh, four invited um, invited questioners who will who will offer their perspective on the assembly and or ask questions from the uh, from the four uh, from the four members and then finally what we'll do is we'll have an opportunity from for questions from the from the rest of the audience uh, the best way of putting a question forward is through the chat there's no way that we can bring everybody into this space so if you've got a question as the as the uh, learning call moves on please put the question in the chat and then uh, my colleague Bjorn Bedstead from um, the Danish Board of Technology will be summarizing those questions and bringing them uh, to the panel towards the end of the session. So without further ado, I would like to welcome um, two, of the, two of the key participants, uh, two of the key players in the uh, German Assembly, uh, Percy Vogel and Julia Hoffman. Um, Percy Vogel has a background in biology and psychology and worked for Mere Democracy for several years before he founded the NGO Berger Beckheim uh, Klimaschutz. That's terrible German. I'm really sorry. This is going to happen a lot, which in English is the Citizens Climate Protection Initiative in 2008. Uh, BBK, that's easier, promotes the implementation of local climate measures by means of direct democracy. And in December last year, BBK, together with um, scientists for the future Germany launched the climate assembly we're talking about today and Percy has been the coordinating BBK, mem BBK member for that pro for the process. Uh, Julia is has led the delivery and facilitation team of the climate assembly. She works for the uh, consultancy IFOC that specializes in participatory processes and communication and IFOC has been involved in two other previous national assemblies in Germany again both led by citizen uh, by, by civil society initiatives, and she designs and facilitates citizens dialogues on climate and energy transition. So two great people to get us going. So I'd like to turn initially to, to Percy and just ask at a very basic level, what was the motivation behind a civil society led climate assembly? We're kind of used to assemblies being run by governments and public authorities. So what earth made you do one? Yeah, well, that is a specific history of uh, citizen assemblies at the national level in Germany. Uh, and it has all to do with the uh, NGO More Democracy, Mehr Demokratie, uh, who were the first ones to start an, uh, such a citizen assembly at the national level in 2019. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where the uh, German uh, journey begins. And uh, that was uh, initiated 
by them, so, so from the civic society, and the topic was democracy itself, democracy and uh, citizen participation. Uh, but already then, uh, politicians were very much involved. They were approached. It was not done in isolation. Uh, so these contacts were there, and uh, from there, that resulted in this uh, second assembly that was already commissioned by the parliament, uh, the German parliament. The topic then was uh, Germany's role in the world. And um, uh, uh, me and my organization, we were observing these processes very much, and many participants and we ourselves, we said from the right why the first one was going on, oh, climate would be a good subject for Germany to do this. And uh, <clears throat> well, as things developed and the second uh, assembly came on, it was clear that before the next elections, there was not going to take place a citizen assembly that was would be commissioned by the government or the parliament um, on climate. And so we decided at some stage, there was a bunch of people who were really interested in a climate assembly. And we said, well, it would be really important to have the results of the climate assembly ready before the next elections, before the next government forms, so that the results can already be taken into account in the coalition treaty. We always, uh, governments in Germany always form out of coalitions of parties. Um, and they, right in the beginning, they make a, a treaty and that is then 80% the basis of everything that happens in terms of legislation for the uh, legislature. And it was, it was just making good use of time too, because there was, it was the, the remaining nine months or so of the, uh, of the legislative period. Um, and uh, in climate, it's all about time. So both making uh, use of the time and, and, and have this kind of yeah, innovative or unique approach so far, uh, providing uh, the results to whoever is going to be the government um, as a as as a as a backup as a as an additional support for ambitious climate policy. So there's a sense in which there was a particular poli political window open because the because you, there was an election coming, and actually this was an opportunity to, to to have an intervention into that electoral process. So that that's really that's really interesting. Exactly. So so how it did seemed you... like a window to us anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll come back to whether it was or is or it, to later and. So how did you go about building a coalition and also governance arrangements in order to ensure that this wasn't just seen as a piece of environmental activism uh, yeah. rather rather than it being a you know so so we 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 typically see these things as sort of being quasi independent having an independent position and and yet mm -hmm. here's a it could be perceived as a bunch of climate activists putting on a climate assembly so how did, how did you make sure that it wasn't seen as a as a sort of biased process in that way yeah, yeah, that was an issue in the beginning, and it's funny how things uh, change over time. Um, but uh, yeah, in, indeed, that, that that was our concern in the beginning too. Uh, the first move we made was um, that we uh, chose a a good uh, first coalition partner. This was co initiated with the Scientists for Future, um, who are kind of activist scientists, but they're also scientists, and they kind of bridged a little bit. Uh, between uh, two worlds. And going from there, it turned out to be, with hindsight, fairly easy to get more civic society organizations involved, also organizations where we would not have um, expected that they would join us so quickly, including the WWF um, and so on. And I, I think that that was only possible because they had observed what was happening? What happened before in France, for example, in UK, and also with the citizen assemblies in in Germany? So uh, all this made it a good uh, deal easier for us to uh, start such an in initiative. Um, and then there were in the governance structure. Yeah, um, it's basically in, in German. We talk about we we say that. My organization was the Trägerverein, so the carrier organization, which means um, it, it is the organization where the funding goes through and they initiate and they commission the whole thing, but there's several organizations involved and it's a trans organizational project. And uh, it was factually the case that this project was fairly isolated from all the other projects that are being run by our own organization. Um, and there's a 
there's an internal logic to the whole process of a, of a citizen assembly that makes it a process in itself because you know uh, the different roles in such a process. Uh, we also took care, of course, to give uh, the whole project uh, its, its own face with a, its own graphic design, own website, and so on. Um, and uh, in terms of roles, um, um, yeah, well, we had a nonpartisan uh, understanding of the whole project from the beginning, and that was reflected in all the communication. Um, we, uh, yeah, with the, our, our um, the supporting organizations that we brought together, they about 86 now. They turned out all to be also very diverse, actually, not just climate organization, not even just um, uh, activist organizations, but also entrepreneurs and um, uh, science organizations and, uh, uh, and so on, social welfare organizations. So that kind, of made, that kind of gave it a, a kind of broad base support from your perspective. Yeah, rather. exactly. Okay. And they only supported us and the process, not knowing what the outcome is, which is pretty amazing in itself. Yeah. I have to emphasize that again. Uh, but what was also important is that we did not make any coalitions with other climate initiatives. It was clear we always had to uh, remind ourselves, but mostly uh, everybody else, that we are not coalition partners in any other kind of campaigns. There was a lot of co cooperation going on before the elections, but it was clear um, our self-understanding is we are just the speaker and promoter of this process. But we cannot, we don't, we have not the legitimacy to make any coalition with other uh, initiatives that wouldn't make any sense, even though you would think we all think about climate. No, we are just, we speak up for the pro project, for the process, and for the citizens, participants, what they say. That's really helpful. This was clear. And uh, one last point we had the luck to have this uh, patron, Schirmherr, the former president, um, Horst Köhler, which uh, with which we were very lucky to have and um, you can uh, be assured that he also when he checked us out he was checking out that we are not did not make any activist impression there was one thing that was left on the website website and they said what is that there and i said oh my gosh yeah that. but that was the only thing we've been in uh, uh in in harmony uh, ever since okay worked in harmony so that turned out well yeah so, so if, if I could ask Julia the same question from the other side, actually, did you have any concerns being commissioned by a civil society organisations to run this rather than by government? Um, I must say concerns like that, not uh, really, but yeah, of course, we, we thought about it a lot because um, yeah, ac acceptance and legitimacy are very key factors for uh, a citizen assembly. So we thought more about it like, Will the results be well received by politicians? So can they have an impact? And second, will actually participants who we're gonna call to call upon, will they actually respond positively to our uh, cause if um, if the sender like the, is a civil society organization? So there there were concerns, but we managed with different um, approaches to overcome them. And Percy already mentioned some of them. Um, so we really try to make a yeah, most neutral process as possible and also to um, create many elements that would uh, secure that um, the process would be sound, uh, would be um, perceived as, um, as balanced. I, I would say. So I can go into some of those details how we did that. So first of all, of course, I have to say it, I'm working for one of the um, agencies um, that did um, the organization um, facilitation and so on. So by definition, we try to be as independent as we can because we, we ensure a good um, deliberation and process. And we were actually free um, agencies, so not only EFOC, but also Nexus Institute and Institute for Participatives Gestalten. So another, so we were three institutions working together, all with different um, experiences. But all of us, we already had worked uh, on citizens' assemblies before, so we were also, um, yeah, already um, experienced. Um, so there was one thing how we did, and we worked quite independently, really, from um, Percy's organization. So 
we, we, we did the process, the concept, the design. We were obviously in touch with each other, um, but um, there was quite independence there. Um, second was important, and first you and actually Graham, you also mentioned it in the beginning, we had a, a framing for the assembly that was non-activist in that sense, because we the question was how can how can Germany reach um, the 1.5 degree um, limit, uh, which Germany actually signed upon signed to uh, in the Paris Agreement. So it's not something that we came up from nowhere. It's actually it's law, and the German government and the German Parliament actually signed and ratified it. Um, third point is we set up a quite elaborate agenda setting process, so that how to come up with the specific questions um, for the assembly. And we also there try to really open the agenda process as much as possible so that no one can say, but you only listen to the environmental organizations um, coming up with the questions. So um, what did we do? We had multiple steps in the agenda setting process. Um, first of all, obviously to mention is our um, scientific advisory board, um, which consisted of more than 20 um, fairly nationally and internationally recognized um, scientists that also again not only came from climate science background but were economists among them sociologists psychologists environmental psychologists etc so um, we also made sure they would, could cover the whole range of environment of climate issues and um, also recognized and not like labeled in any kind of way and also the constitution or composition of the um, advisory board was not done by us, but by the head of the advisory board who was and is um, Dr. Ortwin Renn. He's head of um, um, the Institute of um, Applied <laughs> Sustainability <laughs> Science. But Daniel, you may correct me, yeah. you know better. He's also here from ISS today. And he actually put together um, the members of the, our scientific advisory board. And um, so that was that. And that was the scientific board actually accompanied us I went came with through the process since the beginning very very beginning even before the assembly was actually announced publicly we already had most of the members on board and um, so that was a great asset for us and also for us as um, facilitators a great source of wisdom to draw on um, so we were not steered in the wrong direction Thank you, Daniel, for putting the right thing in the chat. Um, secondly, what did we do again? Also, in the agenda setting process, to find the right questions um, in the whole, like the huge and complex topic of climate change. So, which are the main areas to, that we had to dive into? Obviously, traffic, transport, um, but energy and um, housing, etc. So, but then there's a lot to talk about within these um, specific um, themes. So that's where we talked with the scientific advisory board about, but we also did surveys. Um, first of all, with all the political parties in German parliament. So we did a survey before starting the, um, the assembly and we asked them, what's in, what kind of questions do you have on the climate? What would you like to see that participants discuss in the assembly? And what's your standpoint on, on all these different aspects of climate change? So we assembled all these different opinions from the political parties. We, and I can also say that during the process, we also involved um, the political parties um, from parliament um, in one of our assembly meetings so that we, we got them in as well. Second, we also did surveys among civil society organizations, again, not only with environmental organizations like the usual suspects, but we also asked trade unions and social organizations and um, what their standpoint is and like, so that we don't forget about certain aspects. And third, we also did a survey among citizens with an online survey, also asking the same questions to all of these three um, areas. So that was our agenda setting process. We had to do a little time, a lot of questions had to digest all of it, and then out came like our um, our different um, our four different areas of discussions um, we talked with the citizens about. So that was more or less how we got to the um, final or the detailed questions uh, in the assembly. And last, and then um, we what we also did 
it's not um, not only during the agenda setting process, but during the whole um, process of the citizen assembly, we involved um, another advisory board, um, which but then was not scientific, but composed of members from business co from companies, from trade unions again, also from environmental organizations, but also foundations, and everyone we thought that would like could be interested in the topic of climate change, but also has a valuable opinion on, on the process and also on the outcomes. And they also advised us and gave us, like they, we invited them as observers, observers to the meetings. And we had uh, several meetings with them uh, where they could comment and also comment on the agenda. They could comment on the um, speakers we invited, et cetera. So we made sure it was not baby car <laughs> or Percy to give a, to uh, give the agenda, propose the agenda, not only us, so we try to open the process really, as much yeah, as possible. It's really, it's really impressive. I actually want to just investigate the, the relationship with the scientific experts, but if you, if you don't mind, I'd like to bring in um, Stefan at this point, um, and also um, Alexandra. Um, actually, we'll, we'll just go with Stefan for, oh, we've got Alexandra now here already, so we'll do, we'll see. Um, Stefan's an environmental psychologist who works in the field of science communication, and the link between climate protection and social processes. He's co-author of the handbook Klimaschutz, how do I pronounce that? Klimaschutz, there we go. Uh, handbook Climate Prote uh, Protection, which um, shows how Germany could achieve its uh, Paris Agreement, uh, achieve its uh, Paris Agreement requirements. And um, Alexandra is actually a participant from the uh, member of the assembly. She's originally from the United States and recently moved to Germany and is a translator and interpreter. So I'll, st I'll start with Stefan. Um, there's always this question about um, the robustness, the sort of um, scientific robustness of, of assemblies. And one of the things I'm very impressed about the German assembly is the way in which policy experts were involved, both in the, in the way that Julia was just talking about in terms of the framing and the structure, but also in the process of, um, in the process of recommendation writing, help, helping the uh, members write their recommendations. Do you think it was a robust process from a scientific perspective? Well, I, I think it was in a way, <laughs> but of course, uh, still there are some some yeah points uh, unresolved. Let's say, um, I think the the experts in general they did very well and they really supported the process. And we really had a group of uh, renowned experts, which was very important for uh, creating credibility to the to the process uh, or for the process, but. Um, I think it has to be considered that only because you have uh, really good experts that are supporting your process, it is not, or, or the question of, um, let's say, knowledge transfer and, and the link between uh, science and the people, it's, it's not dealt with. And it's not self-evident that it just happens because you have experts. Um, and maybe it was especially hard um, in Germany because we had uh, no um, concrete task given from government, but it was, um, as, um, yeah, the question was how to, to reach the Paris um, agreement, but the, this in itself is not really cl clear, you know, there are different interpretations of what that means. So um, from the beginning on, there was, let's say, um, yeah, uh, room for, 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 yeah, for, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it wasn't so easy to give scientific answers to, for example, this question, um, what, the, what Paris means actually. And um, I think it is very important. Oh, what is another problem is that experts, the better the experts are, uh, the less time they have. <laughs> Good experts are not necessarily uh, good communicators. So I think it really, what it needs is a special group of, of people that can, can connect the topic and the process that are, let's say, part of both worlds and that, um, yeah, can, can, can link the, the science and, and the people or the, the participants. Um, this is very important. And um, I think in this 
um, on this matter, there's a, a similar problem in society and with uh, climate assemblies, because the, the whole question of um, how to communicate uh, scientific facts, it's really hard because it's one way to, I mean, people know, okay, climate change is there and it's a problem, we have to do something, but to know that on an abstract level is a whole different thing that to know what to do on a concrete level in which mm -hmm. uh, time it has to be done and so on. Um, so do, do you think, um, I mean, I was interested when I was reading about the assembly that um, as, a, as the group of experts that you were, you reviewed at several, a couple of points, the recommendations that were coming out and then provided feedback. Do you think that kind of, that kind of loop works? Is that, is that, is that a good use? Is that a good, inter, is that a good way of bringing expertise to bear in that process of recommendation writing? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, maybe I'm a little bit biased, <laughs> but um, on the other hand, I, I think it helped. I mean, it helped both uh, for making the, uh, the recommendations better, but also if it was good for the people to get some kind of feedback, because if you it's so hard it, it's such a big field and it, there's such a lot of things to know so um, people can easily feel lost and if they get uh, feedback at some points um, I think they have a more self um, self-confidence to to go on with what they do um, okay. so I think this is yeah it, it's really a good um, a good thing to do, even though it cannot solve all the problems, of course. Yeah, of course. At, at that point, I'd, I'd like to bring in Alexandra, who was, who's, um, who's obviously you can't speak on behalf of your 159 colleagues who, uh, who, who participated, Alexandra, but I'm kind of interested in, in, your, in your feeling as to, uh, I, going back to my initial question about, this wasn't organised by a public authority, it was organised by civil society groups. Did your, did, was that a, a, something that members con were concerned about that actually this this wasn't something which was directly um, feeding into the public policy process? Uh, it wasn't my impression that that was a question at the forefront of anybody's mind, um, at least while participating. Maybe now that the recommendations have been finalized and it is um, yet to see what the new government is going to do with our recommendations, whether or not they actually implement them, then that might start to be a more relevant question um, among the participants. Okay, so it wasn't, that's really interesting because very often people say, oh, citizens won't participate in this unless we can show there's a direct, there's a direct influence on policy, but that wasn't the experience of the, uh, the it wasn't your experience at least. No, I think most of the participants had never really heard of a citizens assembly before, and so the the concept was just generally very very new. Um, and so a detail about who organized it, whether or not that was done by um, by by citizens groups or by by a public authority, I don't know if that um, was a, a question that was really at the forefront of our minds. One of the one of the issues that I think maybe I might be putting words in Stefan's mouth here, but one of the issues that um, Stefan kind of inferred was you had this enormous agenda to deal with of climate climate. From your perspective, having gone through this process, did you do you appreciate that broad agenda, or would you do you think these this sort of process would be better focusing on a on a tighter, a smaller number of questions? You know, because you you were having to deal with the whole you know the, the whole of the the climate change agenda uh, policy. Uh, so, so do, you have, do you have any thoughts about that, Alexandra? Yeah, um, personally, I really appreciated that the agenda was very, very broad. Um, I think as a lay person, um, being able to see just how complex climate change is and how much action is needed at so many different levels of society was very illuminating. Um, and I think at least it was my impression that the broad agenda really contributed to um, the participants being more willing to go further with individual recommendations, knowing that it is such a big job and so much needs to happen. So I'm sure there are benefits to having a much tighter agenda as well. Um, but for this project, I 
personally really thought it benefited as a whole from the broad agenda. Thanks, Alexandra. Um, a question for you, for you all, and just a very quick answer, if you would, because uh, I'm very aware that um, we've got a lot to get through in this, this call. What do you think is most striking about the Assembly's recommendations? What is it that, that really captures your imagination about, the, about those uh, recommendations? Uh, Alexandra, why don't I start with you since you helped write them? <laughs> sure. Um, I was very much struck by, after the first round of feedback, how much further our recommendations went, how much more radical they were. Um, so I was just generally very impressed by how people were willing to change their opinions and how maybe um, policies that would have polled very poorly among our group at the beginning or just among German, the German public at the beginning actually went on to make it into our final recommendations. Okay, that's really, that's really interesting. Stefan, what, what was what's most striking for you of the, uh, of the recommendations or, the, or, or either individually or as, or as, a, or as a collective? It's really hard to say, you know, uh, because there's a lot of uh, things interesting about it. Um, I think what is really interesting is that the, um, the participants, uh, they really want to reach 1.5, the 1.5 degrees. So th this was very, very clear for nearly all the participants. And um, of course, when it comes to, to the concrete measures of how to do that, it becomes more um, more uncertain what to do and and if 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 they can support those those concrete measures. But the the global goal is very very clear, and um, I think yeah that is something that I did not expect in in, in that in way. Okay, that's interesting. And and Julie, I mean you've run, you've run a lot of these processes, so you're. So nothing will surprise you because you've seen it. You've seen it. You've seen it all before. So, <laughs> what, what what really what really struck you about about the recommendations that emerged? Every process <laughs> surprises <laughs> you. Let's say that's that's the beauty of it. Uh, I have two things that struck me. Um, if I have to choose, then um, I would say I, I was leading the group of of energy, and I I really um, thought it was very interesting how. Yeah, the participants dived into the very nitty gritty details of energy policy and then, but since we also invited them to always think about social justice um, aspects, they also tried to find ways like how, how to bring in people that maybe do not have the money to afford um, solar energy on their, on their roofs and etc. So I really um, enjoyed seeing the process and how they um, took, uh, made up their minds of coming up with ideas to be more socially inclusive. And second point, I also um, found very interesting that the participants were not staying really within the climate topic at all times. So, so there were also com um, recommendations coming up that went beyond climate topics because they also kind of inter trying. So like uh, that, that, that one of the recommendations was then that um, people should be able to vote um, um, at the age of 16, not only. Okay. 18. Actually, it was not a recommendation, it was part of the um, um, overarching um, methods, like leading um, yeah. principles, but um, it, it came into it because people were thinking like, so if the climate is something that actually affects the young generation more, then also they should be able to vote with 16, well, at the age of 16 already. That's really, and you are right, every process generates really interesting outcomes, I would say. <laughs> Percy, I'm not going to ask you that question, actually. I'm going to ask you a little bit about what you've done with the report, because you've kind of been you, one of the interesting things about um, this assembly is there's a very clear group of people who are taking forward the recommendations. Very often what happens with an assembly is the recommendations are made and then it's not quite clear who owns them. You quite clearly, you and your organisation quite clearly are taking ownership of them and are going out there and talking to politicians and the media and others. So um, we just had I've just noticed we just had an election um, in, in Germany. What, what was your sense of, and obviously you're going to do more work now with, as the coalition develops, what was your sense of the reception of this, of this report amongst political actors? How, how, how difficult has it been for you to get a hearing? Yeah, well, it was uh, uh, many small steps that, that we took. Uh, we started out in April by sending out a, a letter to uh, more than 150 selected politicians at the federal level, uh, announcing the whole thing and then kind of keeping them up updated. And uh, yeah, from early on, we uh, 
arranged meetings, personal meetings with politicians, um, mostly with our colleague uh, Gabriel. Um, and um, yeah, we had many of such meetings and already during the process, uh, during the, while the meetings were taking place of the citizen assembly, uh, we had meetings with politicians only uh, via Zoom, <clears throat> uh, where participants were involved, were invited too. So we talked uh, with many politicians uh, in the presence of part participants, and that was a, always a great help um, to do that. Um, yeah, and then of course we had certain highlights where we made ourselves known through the media. Uh, that was at the beginning of the process with a press conference with our uh, patron, uh, the former President Kohler. Um, and uh, then uh, at the end, when the results came out, we made sure that the results were available the next morning. So uh, the results were uh, uh, decided uh, late in the evening <clears throat> of uh, Wednesday in June. And then parts of our team uh, worked through the night to make, make the results available in a written version and actually a printed version the next morning, uh, where we had uh, the other press conference uh, uh, with uh, uh, the patron, with two participants, and with a major climate scientist uh, from Germany, uh, uh, Wolfgang Lucht. Um, so th these were some highlights. And um, uh, during the process and, and after the process, the media interest um, was, was either on the process as a whole, and we had some uh, very good responses from uh, larger uh, newspapers, um, but with citizen assemblies, there's always a huge interest of local newspapers uh, in interviewing participants from their area. So that was always going on. Um, and then, yeah, during the um, during the election campaign, you could see that the interest uh, grew and, and that, that uh, many politicians already have their positive opinion about the citizen assembly as such. Um, yeah, and finally we managed only uh, two weeks ago to um, reach out to uh, leading politicians of the uh, most important parties in parliament and uh, hand them over the recommendations. So the final report in a photo op so we have pictures of uh, relevant politicians with the report in their hands and with participants standing around them. Um, and, and then of course we made uh, ample use of social media uh, since May. We had to build up our accounts from, from scratch and, uh, um, and you can see that the in interest is, is rising and there you have of course some control over how you present yourself. And I, I think we're doing a good job with that, making ourselves visible. Um, yeah, and the very fact that we did get these photo op uh, uh, opportunities uh, shows that there was a basic um, uh, politicians knew about the that, that, that this was happening. And then there was, uh, in, in the end, there was also, uh, um, yeah, how, how should I say, controversial or tragic thing that actually made helped us make us known there were a, a few young people um, going in hunger strike in front of the parliament building in Germany. And they asked uh, for an immediate meeting with high ranking politicians and for a citizen assembly on climate. And then of course, some uh, we had, didn't have any contact with them in, in advance. And then uh, some media figured out, well, there is already a climate citizen assembly and, 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 uh, and was mentioned in, in many media and there were links to our website. So, yeah, all this worked in the in the right direction, and now we are past the elections, and uh, now we are going. Uh, we're aiming for the coalition negotiations. I assume your strategy at this point slightly changes in focus in, in that you kind of know who your targets are, and well, we assume we know who the targets are. Okay, that that's re that's really helpful. Thank you, Percy. Um, I'd like to invite. Um, as, as we do on these learning calls, some, some people from with different backgrounds to ask some questions. Um, the first person we've got is um, Ava uh, cardona Pons, who's a researcher at the Socio-Environmental Observatory of Menorca and member of the Balearic Islands Climate Assembly Project. 
Uh, Julia, I'm, I'm assuming you wouldn't mind going to work at the Balearic Islands for a, for a few weeks. So, so maybe maybe you know that, that would work nicely for you. Um, so, so Ava, you're in the early stages of your of your development for this assembly next year. Um, what what would your question be to to to, to anyone on our panel? Yes, uh, first of all, congratulations uh, for the very great work you have done. I think there's uh, much to learn from your experience. And my question goes in relation with your management and interaction with the policymakers and the authorities. Because Julia has said already that uh, the political parties were interviewed and were taken in account in setting the, the topics and the background of the, the assembly. And Percy has mentioned that there were several meetings with the politicians where the participants were present. But I would like to know if the, the public uh, representatives of public authorities or politicians were present, uh, were involved during the, the assembly meetings, and if yes, if this had an impact on the on the attitudes of the of the participants. So, how was this interaction, and, and how do you evaluate it, the interaction with with these policymakers? It's a really, it's a really interesting interesting question Eva because there is a real some some assemblies try and keep politicians as far away as possible and others try and bring them into the space so I'm kind of interested Julia what was your as a you know what was your experience as a your your what's your experience of trying to manage that that relationship mm -hmm. um, so as I mentioned before we invited um, representatives of parliament around half of the citizen assembly meetings um, and uh, we gathered questions from the participants beforehand, and then um, we gave them, handed them to the um, politicians. They could answer the questions, and then also participants could answer questions or would be, were, were asked to um, pose questions directly to the um, political representatives. Um, so that was done as part of one, I think it was session seven out of 12. Um, so that was the only session where they were actively invited and I don't know if they actually observed uh, any other sessions afterwards. Um, they could have as silent observer. And other than that, we just had our, um, yeah, our patron who was a former politi politician, but he was more of a um, observer and yeah, supporter for the process. So um, Eva, so we invited them in the agenda setting once and then once during um, the one, one of the meetings in the middle, and then, of course, as Percy mentioned, um, they were obviously one of the target groups uh, where, that um, received the final recommendations. And I mean, Alexandra can say something about how she perceived that special yeah. session, because actually it caused some trouble among these um, participants. Not everyone was really happy with um, in politicians being part of the assembly. Maybe Alexandra, Alexandra from your you, point. Yeah, tell us, tell us what, what it felt like from your side. Um, well, in general, I would say that the whole process was very nonpartisan, but that was probably the one meeting where I could maybe notice, oh, I think maybe I can guess who this person is voting for or where sort of party affiliations kind of came out. Um, and so, I mean, I don't have, I'm, I'm not a, a native German, and so I don't necessarily always pick up on, on signals about no political affiliations, but that was the, the one meeting where um, where it, it seems like there was we were talking more politics and and less about like collective action. I think my experience in running these sorts of things is actually when you bring in political representatives, they actually usually are the most difficult sessions to manage. Uh, if if I'm honest, I think what what per, from what Percy was saying earlier. Um, is the amount of work that seems to have gone on to let people know about it. And I think maybe that's one of the really important things here is about preparing the political representatives for what's going to come, if you see what I mean. So it's not a surprise to them. And actually, it's, it's, it's good to bring them into the process so they understand how it works. They see the person, the people, the participants, they build up some relationship, some form of relationship. All the politicians said, uh, we invited, I think they were five or six, everyone said, send us questions afterwards, we respond to all of them, and, and they were eager to follow the process, so it helps to bring them um, into the process, definitely.
Percy wants to say something quickly before we move on. Yeah, and, and just briefly, but uh, I just want to say that it was a big question before we did it. So, um, so your question is a good one. Where do you want to have politicians in? Where not? But here we went a little bit towards yes, let let, let us invite them uh, because of former experiences and 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 to to get this connection where there formerly is no connection uh, with politics. And I think it was important for this uh, assembly in, in, in particular, but it's uh, in, in general, it, uh, to me, it remains a question, how and where and when do you bring them in? And here we had election campaigning and you could see that they were all talking about their party and stuff. Whereas in other cases, in the former one, it was much more uh, overarching uh, partisan wise, it, it was not so pronounced. Eva, thank you such, for such an interesting question. I think it's actually you've just hidden, you've really hit a nail on the head for work that Kanoka needs to do, thinking about this relationship with, with political representatives in the process. Uh, next is uh, Lise uh, Desotel, who, who um, many of you will know from other Kanoka events. She's, uh, she's part of the Kanoka core team, but previously had been a former advisor to the French Convention Governance Committee. And so she's completely obsessed with questions of governance. Uh, Lise, do you want to? <laughs> Thanks, Graham. Um, and uh, I'm not even going to contradict you. It's absolutely true. Um, actually, yes, my first question regarding governance is uh, how much were the members of the assembly able to input to the program or even participate in the governance? You probably or you both know and you've been, uh, Julia, witnessed a, a session of the French CCC last year. Um, we had members of the assembly joining the governance committee and contributing to define the, the program and the way uh, the CCC was built. Uh, so that's my first question. And also connected to that, maybe just in terms of we've seen in many assemblies how much uh, the process fosters the, the agency of, its, of the members and the fact that they want to go further, they want to learn more, they want to get in touch with uh, stakeholders outside of the processes and, and be able to explain and present the proposal. So my question is, and especially for Alexandra, what's happening now and do you see, do you want to play any role in the explanation, presentation of the proposals and making sure that somehow they reach the legislative process in Germany? Thanks. There's, there's a couple of questions there. Let's start, let's start with Alexandra on the last one, though. I'm kind of interested, do, do you feel, um, do, it has there, is, there, is there a role for you now as someone who's been part of this process? Um, yes, I, and especially because I'm not a German citizen and I, can't, I couldn't vote in this election, um, this, this process was for me a very unique chance to participate in democracy and so um, after we finished with all of the meetings, um, I was very eager to uh, be part of handing over the recommendations to politicians. I was there with, with Percy when we um, gave them. I was also at the recent uh, climate strike in Berlin um, and have tried to be as much as I can um, an advocate among you know, within my own social circle, circles, not only for um, awareness about climate policy, but also for the role of climate or of uh, citizens assemblies as an instrument of democracy. Um, and so these have definitely been uh, topics that have uh, been at the forefront of, of what I am thinking about and talking about and um, as I move about in the world today. Um, and I don't know if uh, you know meeting with politicians is necessarily my strong point, or if that's you know how I'm going to uh, have a greater impact. But um, yes, I, I do think it has been uh, there. There is a role, or this this uh, experience has has transformed the way that I, I think about how to participate in in a democracy in general. And can I ask you, Alexandra, is, is there a formal way of the members? engaging with each other and carrying on working or is this something which you, which each, each individual is choosing to do as they as they wish um, it seems to be mostly individuals just sort of um, pursuing different opportunities since we are spread all over Germany 
there is a, a WhatsApp group, but um, it's a WhatsApp group. So there's a lot of memes and videos sent there. Um, uh, but they do, of course, also share a lot of information about uh, activism opportunities or if somebody goes to speak to one of their local politicians about the Bergerat, they report about it there as well. Okay. Percy, you wanted to jump in because you're going to tell us and about then, the So we have this WhatsApp group that was the, the first, I mean, we invited them to uh, join a, a, a group. And, uh, and, and after that, we also opened a Slack group for the ones who are particularly interested in further cooperating. And so we have a pool of um, uh, over 40 participants who are still active in the sense that they, like Alexandra, uh, help us when we have, uh, you know, when the media, when there are media requests or when we meet politicians and so on. Um, yes, so we, we, have, uh, we have communications after the process. Okay. As an environmental psychologist, Stefan, is this, the, is this the sort of uh, the everyday citizens taking on this role of sort of climate communicators? How does that, how does that look to you? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? I'm saying, what I'm saying is that I'm, I'm interested to, from your perspective as someone who's involved with science communication, the kind of role that people like Alexandra and others can play, do you feel in, term, in terms of bridging that gap in relation to um, in relation to public understanding and um yeah i think it's very important to um, i mean different to address different groups and different uh, institutions and people in different ways i think for um for some people it works best if there's some kind of expert that says uh, you know you have to do it like that and uh, then this is the best form of communication but of course, there are other people who um, feel much more um, involved and, and part of the process and, and I don't know, um, close to the topic if uh, people like them uh, talk to, to them. So I think most important is a mix of, of uh, well, that, that sounds very technically, but a mix of, of people uh, to to communicate in in different ways and on different platforms and so on and of course the participants um also have a have a huge bonus of of credibility and yeah so so i think it's important yes yeah no and it's really interesting that people like alexandra you're kind of like a very unusual person to have gone through this kind of process it's like a, um whether i'm sure it's a good thing i'm <laughs> definitely a good thing and Judah, just very, very brief, uh, briefly, um, how, were, how were, were members involved in the governance arrangements at all? We didn't give them a like permanent role in the governance uh, structure. Um, as Lise uh, said that they did in uh, the French Citizen Assembly, which we also um, <laughs> observed, right? Um, but mostly because of our process was shorter and much more in a higher frequency as uh, the French Citizen Assembly took place, um, we decided uh, to not uh, do it like this. But what we did is around the half time, or maybe a little bit earlier, we invited um, members of all, um, from all groups, from all um, subgroups. We had energy, um, housing, um, food and um, traffic and transport. So we invited uh, two members of all of each group to come for an intermediate um, from yeah, um, meeting an evaluation or feedback meeting and we, we met with them and they could bring in all the points um, that they would like to improve or that they already liked and also of course um, participants used the chance to actually um, say what they didn't like or especially like in the beginning or end of sessions um, no way of holding that back <laughs> so um, we also learned uh, during the sessions what people were thinking about and would like to change actually firstly i'm gonna to have to move on because we're short we're short of time sorry about that thanks thanks so much lise um the the third person we got in is uh, is romain uh, laugia he's the climate and energy policy officer at wwf europe and the climate um, pact ambassador uh trying to bring a kind of a European perspective on this and maybe think about what this might tell us about European engagement. Romain, the floor's yours. Yes, hello, thanks everybody. Um, 
glad to be here. Yeah, congratulations to the organizer, organizers of this uh, assembly. I mean, you're showing that there's nothing that uh, that can stop a group of committed and, and organized uh, civil society representatives. So really good. Uh, I work at EU level, but it doesn't mean I, I, I don't see that citizens actually have a, a big role and part of the answer on how we, we keep global warming below 1.5 degree. And this is, I think, particularly important because citizens for now, uh, not, not citizens, but uh, politicians for now have not showed us the ways that it can be done. So any solution that can be done from citizens that can be put forward from the bottom to the top are, are clearly uh, much needed. So uh, I work at EU level and uh, honestly, we really do lack this kind of initiatives on citizens involvement. So uh, we don't ask typically the, any citizens what kind of fundamental policy choice they would want to make to decarbonize the, the economy. Initiatives to develop a common vision on, on EU climate rules on the rounds and not just asking about citizens, do you, do you want to have a wind farm in your, in your region, in your backyard? And that eventually calls upon people to adopt a defensive approach to be, to be opposed rather than to be involved. And you're, you're showing exactly the contrary with the citizens assembly. You're not asking people to say yes or no, but you're asking them to actually find the answer together. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is something we don't see at EU level. The classical way for the commissions to, to go ahead and propose a solution is simply to launch some sort of general feedback consultations, asking citizens uh, whether they agree with certain uh, par parameters which are established before a legislative proposal is, uh, is set, but it is all very specific and actually uh, it's a bit used by the commission as a justification for proposing what it planned initially to do in the first place so it's a bit using you know eu citizens want to act on climate change but nobody knows what actually citizens want to do more specifically so they're often used as a not as a scapegoat but a bit as a, something to, to cover so uh, my question um, for you is, is actually whether you think it would be desirable or even it could be possible to replicate your experiment that you've done at the, at the national level to another level, more global, the, the EU level, uh, asking a randomized group of citizens what kind of climate rules they would want to be proposed at EU level. Uh, I know it can be a bit a technical and dry arena, the, the EU one on policy making, but at the end of the day, it's extremely political. And a lot of national debates we see are actually sent later on to the EU level, such as what kind of climate targets do we want to adopt? What kind of uh, measures should be imposed? Uh, carbon pricing in specific sectors or stopping fossil fuel subsidies, banning fuel space vehicle by a certain date. All of those are actually also translated at the EU level. So uh, is there a way and do, do, you see, do you see possibilities or too many hurdles maybe to, to try and do that at the EU level? Thank you. Thank you so much, Romain. I'm just going to ask Percy because you know you've got nothing to do now. You, you finished. You finished the assembly. So do you think? So do you think a, a, you know a, a citizen-led this kind of citizen-led process could work at European level? Uh, yes, in theory it could. Um, so there's no uh, in pr principle um, problem with the process as such. Uh, but first, of course, you need the right attitude from the EU level, uh, not to do uh, just a and what I call an extractive uh, citizen participation. Um, but you really have to take the idea of a citizen assembly seriously, because what is very important, particularly for the climate subject, but also for, for other ones, is this uh, is the synchronized experiences of the participants. They, they come together and together they learn first about the problem, and in this case about the huge dimensions of the problem, and then they learn about the necessary uh, steps to be taken. Uh, sometimes you have certain alternatives, some, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you just realize, my gosh, we have to do this. We have to, I don't know, build so much renewables or whatever. Um, but uh, there's no, uh, I mean, when else does it happen that a bunch of people, uh, either parliament or whatever, is exposed to the problems and solution at the same time in, in this way. And <clears throat> so you have to put a lot of effort and time and preparation into that. Um, the only thing to consider at the EU level is that the, I mean, the solutions have to be at the EU level, but I think you have to um, explain 
and show and include what the effects are at the local level too, um, so that it, it's not too detached from the ground. That it's the same for the German citizen assembly. Now, after this German citizen assembly, I think uh, we should do lots of local citizen assemblies um, where we put, um, yeah, as, as some conflicts only actually really show up and can be solved at the local level. And so this is all the more true for the EU level. But there's, I mean, you know, it's the translation thing, but there's the infrastructure for interpretation translation at the EU level. Um, it can be done. We do have um, we do have the one of the panels for the Conference of Europe is actually on climate change, although yes. it's it's no, it, it isn't going to have the time that you guys had. It's not going to have the kind of resources probably. It's been a bit rushed, but that does give us an indicate. Maybe it'll be interesting to know whether on the back of that we could see the possibility of, you know, either, either it's going to go badly or it's going to go well enough that it's something that we can uh, we can build on. We'll see. It's this weekend actually. Yeah, yeah, and in fact, some people in uh, supporting this call are involved in it. So, uh, so yeah, I, I'm not going to okay. say, I'm not going to say any, I'm not going to say any more. <laughs> um, Romain, thank you so much for the the question. That was really that was really great. Our, la our last contributor is um, is Daniel Oppold, who's a researcher at IASS, um, which which was um, the organisation who's so the, the the director of IASS was one of the, was the was one of, a key player in the process. So Daniel, I, I invited you to kind of come and from your perspective, slightly outside the process to ask to, to say what you thought about it. I mean, obviously, these are people you want to spend time with afterwards, so you've got to be careful here. But um, I'm just I'd be interested on in your reflections and whether you have any questions for the for the panel. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Graham. Um, yeah, you, you guys talked about it a lot already. Um, the, the special feature of this uh, citizens assembly or this climate assembly was that it's civil society organized. And um, well, we, we also <laughs> talked about that this might be a risky endeavor and uh, because you, you have the missing link to the representative system, which is usually one of the key defining um, qualities of a citizens assembly in comparison to other forms of, of uh, public engagement. Nevertheless, there might be a lot of people on the call um, who, who hear about your experiences and also how you beautifully employed these windows of opportunity uh, on, on the German landscape to make it happen anyways, and also make sure that it has uh, some effect. But um, if you if you want to take that uh, abroad, if other people say, well, we'd like to make something like that happen in, in our country and not wait for the political uh, sphere to invite us. Um, may, maybe you might share some reflections what special advantages are of initiating something like that from civil society and, um, and maybe also some recommendations what to bear in mind um, when you do so. That's great. Ste Stefan, I'm going to start with you because you've actually, you know, you're also a member of uh, Mere Democracy. I can see it's, it's written on your, it's written on your, uh, on your um, panel. But um, I'm just interested from your perspective about, uh, in response to that question from Daniel, about what what do you need to know about if you're going to lead if you you know if you're going to drive this from civil society rather than from 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 um, public sector. Yeah, I don't know really. I think uh, the the challenge for um, climate assemblies um, is that I mean it's only half of the work to find good solutions. The the maybe bigger half of the problem is uh, that um, someone has to implement those solutions and I think this um, it seems that it is very hard if you do it um, like we did from the from a civil society um, movement um, but on the other hand we can see in in France for example that even if you have the like government as a as the initiator of, of the process, it's not guaranteed that uh, your solutions um, make it uh, to, to the law process or whatever. So I think this is, in general, this is a big challenge for, for the whole climate assembly um, thing. And I, I'm not sure of how to do it, deal with it. I think it, of course, it helps a lot when you have um, a big um, base of, of, of 
um, different organizations that support you. And if you also, of course, have the media on your side, this makes it a lot more uh, productive and, and um, maybe triggers some kind of learning process for society apart from the, from the whole lawmaking thing. Um, yeah, but it's hard. I don't have the solution for that. <laughs> I think, I think one of the interesting things here that, that I've picked up from this is about how much work has been done trying to engage political actors throughout the process at the start, during it and after it. And surely that's something which even, even government led processes need to learn because you know very often they don't do that. Julia. I would also add that being a like civil society um, initiated project we, and that's what our, um, we focused on a more broad um, question and focus for the citizen assembly because that was also one of the intentions to show that civil, um, that people and citizens when asked and actually indulging or like going into the topic of um, um, climate change, when they get, when they inform themselves, they can have um, an informed opinion about it and come up with recommendations that actually go along quite with what uh, scientists also recommend. So it was more of a broad um, yeah, spectrum um, that we discussed with the citizens about, but it was also needed because it was also supposed to be a sign from, that's what citizens think when they actually inform themselves or get information on the topic and have time to think about it, discuss with each other and um, see pros and cons about it. But uh, if you do it with government or from any, initiated by a government, I would say you can go more into the specifics of specific problems that government wants to be solved and where they actually have problems um, to, to find solutions with. And then you can go more into the detail and um, get more specific solutions that the government actually can really use to solve problems they cannot solve on by, them, by themselves. So I would see a bit of a difference there. And that's also um, how it in the end um, ended up with um, our citizen assembly it was more broad, but it also needed that broadness as an initial initiative to show um, informed citizens um, take climate change very, very serious. Okay. Da Daniel, thank, thanks for the question. Oh, go on, jump, jump back in. No, may maybe just a, a quick follow up question or, or statement. Make, um, make it a comment rather than a question because I need yeah, to figure sure. it <laughs> No, um, as, a, as a NOCA member, also, um, I think the, there's a general question arising from, from this experience whether it's actually a, a normatively good idea to, um, to also yeah, use citizens' assemblies uh, without uh, collaboration with the government um, beforehand. Um, or not, and and if yes, why and how, and uh, to work out all those pros and cons, I think that could be um, a very interesting work stream yeah. for NOCA. No, I think I think that's right, and I think the uh, yeah, well, that's very valuable. Percy, did you want to just add something quickly before we move on to the next? Yes, I, 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 want to, I mean we did we did it only out of desperation, really, because <laughs> time time and climate, you know, any other uh, topic you can postpone for a few years but we felt really we were under time pressure. And it was not only a civic society initiated, it was also <clears throat> uh, clear that the results come out during election campaigning. So that was the other important factor. And that made it an uh, interesting experiment. And actually I find it at least as cool as being having one commissioned by the government, <laughs> but whether it has been worthwhile, um, I can already say it has been worthwhile, but uh, still we have a few months to go from here. Yeah, and I think again, in response to Daniel's point, so much of the response to this may be very contextual, in the sense you know Germany was in a very particular point, you know, had a federal election coming up, etc. And that yeah, exactly you know, that makes a big difference, I think. Okay, so um, what we're moving on to the last section, and this is we've been having quite a busy um, chat uh, going on, and what I'd like to do is um, this is where I put my colleagues in a really difficult situation where they have to try and summarize everything that's gone on, and they show. They show why they're such a good facilitator. So if I could bring um, Bjorn uh, Bedstead in and Bjorn, um, if you'd give us a sense of some of the questions that have been asked and what I do, what we'll do is we'll use this as a as a way of moving towards the end of the call, allowing our four participants to pick up on those questions that they think are particularly relevant for them. So if you could give a, sen a sense of the sorts of things that are being asked, that would be wonderful. 
There hasn't been a whole lot of questions actually uh, online. There's a few on um, the selection process on of uh, of the citizens. Uh, what was uh, the methodology? Um, and uh, also, um, uh, were there any language problems uh, for some of the participants because uh, migration background was a criterion for recruitment? Um, then there's one to uh, Stefan, uh, whether or not the experts uh, helped on ensuring uh, recommendations uh, could be taken by the policymakers as concrete options that were feasible to be implemented. And there's one from Laurie on uh, whether or not the assembly had a budget and strategy for, uh, for media uh, relations. Um, in continuation of that question, how much public engagement was there and how much legitimacy uh, do these climate assembly recommendations uh, really have? which is a separate question, I guess, from the one on, on media. Um, I don't know who would like to answer yeah. uh, about uh, the selection process. It's probably probably best if um, Julia talks about that. Thanks, yeah. thanks Bjorn. So Julia, do you wanna talk just very briefly about the selection process and this issue of, of, of language as well? And then I'll move on to others about the, uh, the other questions. Sure, I'll do that. I was trying to find the figures actually, but I'm not sure I can find them on time. Um, but the selection process, um, we used phone calls, um, so randomly generated um, mobile and uh, landline numbers that um, were generated by a um, service provider and um, they called, um, I must, I, I can't say the right number, right, because I didn't find it on time. Um, um, but over 10,000 calls definitely were made. And then, um, so then were, people were asked, people who responded were asked whether they would be interested in participating in the citizen assembly. And then uh, if they said yes, they were sent further information via email um, or um, post or mail. And then, um, yep, they were invited. So, and then we asked uh, about different criteria um, to for selection, like uh, that was mentioned already, mig migration background, age, um, gender, um, et cetera. And um, we also had um, obviously um, education background was one of the criteria as well, and also where people came from. So like, so that we made sure that participants came from all um, 16 federal states in Germany, for example, and also that we had a mixture of yeah, cities and rural backgrounds. Um, so that was um, the word, the selection criteria. So from did you have those any, did you have, Sorry, did you have any language issues, Julia? Did you have anybody who who's the person who wasn't able to communicate uh, effectively in German, or that wasn't an issue for you? I um, haven't heard of any, and um, we almost. We, we didn't reach the, the same percentage as the census says um, that um, people with migration background live in Germany, but we got quite close to it, or let's say we were happy with the results we got so far, and um, we didn't encounter language problems. It was more some actually an age problem at some stage, because since we did everything online, uh, I don't know if we actually mentioned that every the whole climate assembly was done online. So we actually had to train people a lot on getting uh, getting across like, Zoom and all yeah. the, we had another platform to use where they could find information and could chat with each other. So that was more of a problem to get, especially the elder people to, okay. to use those. Thanks, Julia. Ste Stefan, there was a question about whether or not um, it was part of your role to um, make the, help make the proposals more feasible. We've already heard you and Alexandra reflect on the fact that they were more radical than you might have expected, but were they feasible? <laughs> yeah, I think um, it's an I'm sorry, and was that a role of the experts to help make them more feasible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think uh, the expert experts uh, helped to make to make it more feasible, but still, um, there's a big question of what kind of recommendations you expect from the process. You know, is it more uh, general goals. Uh, so let's say we want to reach the 1.5 degree um, goal or the two 
uh, point degree, a two degree goal. So, <laughs> um, or or do you expect concrete measures like uh, we want uh, three hundred uh, solar energy panels built in the next two months in anywhere? You know, and I think there's a, a big tension between those those two things because if you have um, general goals of course this is interesting on on the one hand but on the other hand everyone wants to reach those goals but the question is how and on the other hand um, the problem with um, with developing two concrete measures is that there's a huge interconnectedness. So if you develop recommendations for the traffic and for, I don't know, heating of homes, then of course this has um, influence on, on the structure of your energy system. And I think it is, it is very hard for, for people who, who are not experts and even for experts in, in such a short amount of time to, um, to integrate all those things to um, to a concept that is really working, and I, this is the problem with the re recommendations. And I think what you have or what you can expect, and what is what is meaningful, is that you have something in between, like directions, and those directions have to be filled um, with with more details by experts. Uh, I think, and, and maybe even by, by politicians in a way. Um, the important thing is those experts or the, the politicians, they have to be, um, let's say they, they, they have to support the process, you know. If you read the, the directions from the citizens and you have, you're bad-minded, uh, or you can, you can uh, interpret them in a way that in the end you, you have to do nothing. And of course, it doesn't work that way. You really have to 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 have experts and, and politicians who want to 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 see the potential in the in the recommendations and then fill it with with life on a on a level of law and concrete measures. Before Jude, before Alexandra, I was just interested. You were nodding when um, Stefan was talking about the interaction between the important role that experts played in helping you think through the. The implications and the feasibility of different um, recommendations. I'm just wondering what your experience of that was. Yes, about halfway through the process, we had drafted several recommendations, and all of these were reviewed by experts, and they gave us feedback about how effective they would be in meeting the 1.5 degree limit, and then also how feasible they were. And so I remember that one, one particular idea that pulled very well in my group was a sort of like per person uh, carbon budget. And the experts told us there's just no way to really implement that as, as great as, as, as it is. And as much as you might like this idea, there's all of these um, data privacy things. There's no way that you can really track what people buy at the supermarket and how much they drive. And so we did get a lot of feedback like that. And I think that that meeting in particular was so productive for how we talked about um, or how we created recommendations moving forward. I like this model as sort of as almost like a critical friend of kind of coming in and because yes. I, I know in France, they were much more very often co-created with experts, but it sounds to me like you put your ideas forward, they told you, you know, kind of gave you some some feedback about it. That sounds that sounds really interesting. You all, I think a similar kind of thing happened in De demo. Oh, Julia's waving. Quickly, Julia. I, ju <laughs> I just wanted to add because I didn't have the chance to say that beforehand um, on the like on the type of scientific uh, advisory, the participants and also we as organizers um, got big um, and Alexander also mentioned that a bit now and uh, Stefan, there was all, not only the the um, advisory in between, like how effective and how much impact the recommendations would have, but we also had like fact checkers um, participating in all the meetings in all the 12 meetings, um, being experts in different fields um, of um, in climate and the different working groups. So that's maybe also an some interesting for um, people here um, to know. And we also had not only the scientific advisory board who actually also got 
all the recommendations in their draft status <laughs> to, to look at, but we also um, had more people, more scientists um, joining and supporting that process, preparing the sessions, but also revising um, the recommendations um, in between. So um, yeah, we really drew on a lot of expertise and I would I just Steph wanted to mention yeah. that. No, it's good. And I take, completely take Stefan's point about, about how how detailed can you expect these kinds of uh, these these sorts of proposals to be, and what role is there for for politicians in that? Because I, I know one of the problems in France has been that many parliamentarians feel that their job has been taken away from them because they've been given specific regulations and specific laws. So it's got very interesting. I think it's a really interesting question about what sort of outputs are right from assemblies. Bjorn, there was a question I think you said about budgets. What can you remind me what that was? I think this is one for. Capacity. Yeah, th there was a question as to whether the assembly had a media budget and uh, strategy. Yeah, I guess, of course. So we, um, uh, on the one hand, we uh, uh, fundraised uh, the money, basically the bulk of the money went through the process, so to the eight agencies. But uh, then the, uh, the other task was uh, to do all the media work and the uh, <clears throat> public relations and talking to the politicians. And that was a, a se separate uh, budget for which we uh, fundraised uh, from uh, different sources. And being a <clears throat> yeah, strategy, we are, we are always strategizing. So it was not that we started out with a particular strategy. We're always readjusting our strategies at each phase. Right now, we're readjusting to how to deal with the uh, coalition things. But we, we do have a. Um, uh, a, a special a professional um, press and public relation person, and we are cooperating with a uh, uh, media <clears throat> and public relation agent agency, which is important because sometimes there's uh, more work to do and sometimes less work. And so we have expertise and several people who strategize in this respect. I mean, at, to, to be honest, I think compared to most assemblies, you've probably done more work on media strategy because you knew that was what you were going to have to do compared to those people who work for government, you know, who are doing a government sponsored one where, where media might become a, a secondary concern. This was actually a primary concern for you. So it's really, it's really yeah, ex exactly. And, and, and again, we, we knew that was going to be our role. That was what happened with uh, uh, before with the other two um, assemblies where more democracy had this role. So I, I could go on for, for much longer, for another hour or so, even longer now. I, fa I found this completely fascinating. It's particularly as this, the, the German um, assembly has had this kind of base in civil society and, and is in relation to a particular ele election campaign, as well as trying to more generally think about, um, uh, you know, uh, Germany's climate approach to climate policy. But I, I just want to thank so much, uh, Percy, Julia, Stefan, and Alexandra for joining us and for the work that they've done. I mean, uh, all of you in your different ways have contributed to what is a really, a really interesting and fascinating um, project, which we are, I, I know we're going to learn from for, for many years to come. So, um, so thank you so much for the work you've done and for the time you've given me, you've given us today. It's been really, really insightful. So thank you. And just to, just to end, um, just to say a couple of words about what we're up to. Um, so. Uh, Kanoka will be running an event on the 9th of November on what is a climate assembly. We realise that the members of Kanoka may have various levels of knowledge. So this will be a kind of entry level um, discussion, entry level introduction to um, what is a climate assembly, what are the key elements, what, what, what is it we need to know if you're going to organise a climate assembly. We're also planning towards the end of November, it's very early, it's still in the planning stage, an event which will look back at the French Convention and the United Kingdom Climate Assembly. Um, given that they both reported around a year ago, we're going to look at where they, what, what's happened to those processes since and what we can learn from that. And we're also going to be in the next um, few weeks talking about um, providing some more details about how we plan to take our work programs forward as a network and not just being driven by the management committee. Uh, finally, if you're interested in um, organising or collaborating with Kanoka on an event like this or, or on another issue around climate assemblies, please do get in touch via the events page on our website. So just once more, I'd like to say thank you so much to the various people who have joined us today. Um, I think this combination of a civil society, 
and scientific community led assembly and one that is focused on a very particular point in the political cycle in this case the election uh, the federal elections in germany gives us a lot of food for thought um, i'd like to thank you for being with us and uh, look forward to seeing you at another event uh, sometime soon take care